Okay, let's get started. So good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to today's installment of the 2023 Virtual Summit Guest Lecture Series. My name is Alex Krauser, a member of the Model G20 Committee, and I'll be hosting today's lecture. From our expert today, we'll be learning about climate change and energy, our transition away from fossil fuels, how this transition can be supported by decentralizing our electrical grids, and how we can reduce emissions by integrating smart technologies into buildings at scale. Following the lecture, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions in a live Q&A session. So when we get there, please post your questions in the Zoom chat and I'll read them aloud for our expert to answer. So throughout his lecture, make sure you're thinking about something you'd like to ask him, maybe write it down uh, so that when the time comes, you can post it. Uh, because this is an exciting opportunity to learn from one of the brightest minds in the fields. Um, that having been said, actually, uh, during the lecture, if you have any questions or need for clarification on something, uh, please post it in the Zoom chat and we'll make sure it gets answered. So the lecture and Q&A session should give you plenty to think about as you develop your policy solutions throughout the upcoming summit. Uh, and then just a quick technical note before we get started. Uh, our speaker will be sharing slides as he speaks. So if you'd like to view both the slides and the speaker, you can click view on the upper right of your Zoom window and select side-by-side -side speaker. So without further ado, let's get started. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Alex Inz Cushman, the co-founder and CEO of Branch Energy, a technology-focused green energy provider that helps consumers reduce their energy bills and carbon footprints. Since their beginnings, Branch Energy has planted over 10,000 trees and delivered more than 35 gigawatt hours of green energy, saving each of their customers over $200 per year. Before founding Branch Energy, Dr. Inz Cushman was the chief technology officer of a multi-billion dollar energy company and spent years working in Silicon Valley as a technologist. He holds a PhD in nuclear fusion from MIT and a BS in aerospace engineering from the University of Toronto. Dr. Inz Cushman is a regular speaker on multiple podcasts about entrepreneurial ventures and sustainability. Uh, so, uh, Alex, we are incredibly honored and excited for you to share your expertise with us. Uh, welcome. So I'll stop sharing my screen and let you take it away. Great. Well, Alex, thanks very much for the, the gracious introduction. And I guess I should like apologize to everybody in the audience for having all of the speakers be Alex. That's probably confusing. Um, uh, but c'est la vie. Uh, and also thanks everyone for, for joining us. Uh, as uh, Alex mentioned, I know that it's a, it's a global crew and um, people are joining from all kinds of crazy time zones. For, so for those who are up very, very early um, or, or very, very late. I, I'll, I'll do my best to make it worth your time. Uh, I'll, I'll certainly try. Um, so uh, as Alex mentioned, um, a bunch of topics we're gonna hit on today, um, climate change in general, energy transition, um, and in particular, the decentralization of the grid, which is an important part of the energy transition, which um, is, is under discussed in my opinion. Um, but before we sort of dive into sort of the, the graphs and, and all that, I thought it might be helpful to give you a little bit of context on myself um, so you can get a sense of, of where I'm coming from and how I ended up working in climate. Um, so my story begins, this is a, an aerial shot of my high school from, uh, from Google Maps, good old Google Maps. Um, but uh, this is where it started for me in the sense that this is where I got really, really interested um, in math and science. Uh, and uh, I had some great teachers, got involved in, you know, extracurricular stuff, not dissimilar to what you guys are up to here with G20. Um, and uh, that passion led me um, to doing work in college um, in engineering, which uh, eventually um, ended, ended me up um, over in Boston, uh, uh, where I, I did a PhD um, at MIT in nuclear fusion. And this is actually a uh, a sort of wide angle lens uh, shot of the inside of the fusion reactor that I worked on. Um, 
Alcator C mod for those fusion buffs out there. Uh, and it was great. I love the research. It was really interesting. You got to work with a ton of really smart people, um, highly collaborative environment. Um, that said, it was still like very theoretical. And I'm, I was like a little bit more hands-on. I wanted to sort of um, do things that were going to start impacting society a little bit more uh, immediately. Uh, and so I ended up uh, leaving academia. Um, and um, after a few zigs and zags, uh, ended up moving out to San Francisco and um, spent a number of years in Silicon Valley, uh, learning just a ton about how to make software um, and software products uh, that are great. Um, so I did that for a number of years uh, before getting a job offer to um, join a, a large energy company back in my hometown in Toronto. So I ended up doing a little bit of a circuit um, where I had the opportunity to work on delivering power to millions of customers uh, and get back in uh, to working on energy, which is sort of where I started. Um, so full circle in more than one sense. Um, so, so that got, that gets me up to about sort of uh, a few years ago around sort of 2020 or so, um, when I started reading more and more about, um, climate and what kept, kept coming up and up again and again, were these, um, IPCC reports, these, uh, international governmental panel on climate change, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's basically a, a UN organization that gathers all the sort of research being done. Um, on all things climate and puts together these like very dense comprehensive reports um, and they're referenced all the time and I'm like well I'm supposed to be a physics nerd I should like go read some of the primary source material um, and so uh, I did and I ended up reading several hundred pages of these reports and to be candid it was super grim reading um, I'm a pretty optimistic person by disposition but uh, you know it's there's some really hard truths in these reports around how how staggeringly large the challenge is um, and, you know, while it's certainly hard to condense, you know, all, all the work that's been done uh, to put these reports together just in a few minutes, I thought I, I'd, I'd spend a little bit of time on some of the highlights to give people a sense of the just magnitude of the challenge. Um, so this first graph here is, is showing uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration uh, over the last sort of 2,000 years or so. So the, the x-axis here goes, you know, 2000 years ago to present day. And the y-axis is the parts per million of CO2 concentration. So basically how much CO2 there is in our atmosphere. Um, and you know it doesn't take a huge number of years of, of study to sort of see the pattern in this graph, right? We can see that about 150 years ago, around the start of the industrial revolution, when we started burning fossil fuels in earnest, the, the concentration of CO2 is, has gone up dramatically. And we're now up over, uh, 4,000 parts per million, um, which which unfortunately is an un unsustainably high number. Um, and so if, if we then look at on the same time scale, well, what has been the Im impact on temperature, right? So CO2 is a greenhouse gas, which is supposed to impact temperature. Um, if we then look at, at that, this, this graph on the left here, again, is sort of a 2,000-year time scale, going back about 2,000 years. And the y-axis here, instead of being CO2 concentration, it's the change in global surface temperature, right? So roughly how warm the earth is. Um, and here too, we see a similar trend, right? That in the last 150 years or so, there's been a dramatic increase in surface temperature. And then this graph on the right is showing for the last 150 years, um, the sort of orange shade is showing both observed and simulations of, of what the surface temperature is. And then those sort of like greenish shade is showing this, what the simulations would show the surface would, temperature would be if not for the anthropogenic or like the human caused uh, activities. Um, and you can see that there's a pretty stark difference there, right? The, the sort of simulated just natural sources uh, is pretty flat. And we can see that what's both observed and simulated is up over one degree Celsius uh, of warming already, which for those who are used to Fahrenheit, is a little bit less than two degrees um, Fahrenheit. Um, so we're already starting to see substantial warming of the Earth. Um, and while one, you know, a degree Celsius or a few degrees Fahrenheit doesn't sound like a big deal, um, those averages sort of hide that it creates much, much more dramatic effects in the extremes. And so even this level of warming is already starting to change the planet. Uh, and so you can imagine what's going to happen if we start seeing sort of two, three, four, five degree temperatures. It'll get 
um, you know, ex literally exponentially worse. Um, and so thinking about scenarios now, this graph here is showing not the past, but projected futures, what might happen. Uh, and then the y-axis here is showing global greenhouse gas emissions. So what you can see here is that we're, we're currently around 50 gigatons of CO2 being emitted globally per year, or CO2 equivalent. Um, so that's 50 billion tons, which is a lot. Um, and this giant red uh, sort of flash that's going up on the right, this is what we would have expected had we not taken any actions whatsoever, right? So if we weren't starting to work uh, on addressing the climate climate change, emissions would have continued to grow and we would have been looking at, you know, four or five degrees Celsius of warming. Um, and and it's, I think it's fair to say, and I think there's general consensus on this, that, you know, that level of warming would have been absolutely catastrophic. So the good news is that we are no longer on that trajectory, the, like the super terrible one. Um, and uh, our current policies, uh, which is this sort of second band in red here, um, it's estimated that we'll probably come on, come in under three degrees, uh, but still a, a lot of warming, and certainly more than than uh, what would what would be ideal. Um, this this little band down here, sort of two point four, that's sort of about what's estimated if everybody meets the pledges and targets that they've already made. Um, and then these two bands down here show what the path might be for emissions to keep us below two degrees Celsius or 1.5, which is you know around the, the range where uh, scientists feel we're much more likely to avoid the worst of climate change, right? So the amount of damage that you do grows as you go past the sort of like 1.5 to quite, quite a bit more steeply. Um, and I think the main sort of takeaway from this, this graph is that if we want to keep warming below two degrees Celsius, it's not that we just have to reduce emissions by you know 50 percent or 70 percent or 80 percent. We have to get net emissions effectively to zero, um, which is a, just a much much harder task than than sort of a fractional reduction in emissions, um, and it has profound implications for which sort of technologies we pursue, um, because getting to zero is just so much different than sort of you know again a, a simple reduction. Um, the other sort of unfortunate truth here is that the amount of investment required to hit those targets, right, to like keep, keep things below, you know, 1.5, 2 degrees, you know, people, intelligent people can disagree on the exact amount that it's going to take. But I'd say everybody agrees, you know, both advocates and detractors that it's, it's trillions of dollars a year, right? Like some say it's one or two trillion, others say it's three or four, but it's, it's, it's a number measured in trillions of dollars a year, and not just once, but for decades. Uh, so this we're talking about really, really enormous amounts of money. Um, and to put that in context, I uh, last night I, I went and looked up the, the net worth of the 10 richest people in the world. Um, and if you, if you add all that up, it's about 1.2 trillion, um, which is a lot of money, but you know the, the IPCC is estimating it's about $3.5 trillion a year of investment, right? And if they were right, that would be about four months of investment, right? And um, so I'm saying this not to like let the billionaires off the hook. I mean, certainly I hope they uh, contribute as much as uh, they can to, to fighting climate change, but it's just to say that it's not enough, right? Like even if all the richest people in the world gave away most of their most of their wealth, philanthropic efforts alone are not going to be enough to solve this problem. Um, and so I think one one thing that I, one major takeaway I, uh, I had from sort of reading through all those reports um, was that if we really want to make it dent at climate change, obviously we got to focus on things that are emissions reducing, right? That are CO2 negative, that, that'll drive some climate benefit. Um, but we also want to focus on things that are economically beneficial, right? Because if you can do that, if you can sort of, if you can focus there, then it's not just a pure philanthropic exercise. You can you can draw in uh, resources from folks who want to like, you know, build businesses and whatever. Um, and if you sort of focus at that intersection, you have a much better chance of having an impact at scale. So, so that's that's sort of where I came to after my little. Uh, my little studies exercise over a few months. Um, 
And then the next most obvious thing is like, okay, well, if, if, if you want to sort of spend time on client and have an impact, where do you start? Um, and for me, it was, it was straightforward in the sense that uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking and learning about the energy system. And it turns out um, that energy is a large fraction of what's driving greenhouse gas emissions. So th this is a, a sort of blown out pie chart showing where greenhouse gas emissions are coming from uh, in, for, in terms of like human activity. Uh, and as you can see, energy is sort of a, you know the dominant fraction of that, right? So if we can figure out ways to reduce our uh, energy usage or, or decarbonize it, um, that's a great area to spend time on because it, it'll it'll be a big lever um, around getting that 50 gigatons of, of CO2 down to zero over the next few decades. Um, and so that's why I think you hear so much about you know the energy transition, and and oftentimes people think of it as almost synonymous with climate change. Um, and it's it's a big chunk, but it's not everything, right? So certainly there's lots of great work that needs to be done everywhere. So I don't I don't mean to um, uh, to de-emphasize the importance of those other things, um, but energy certainly needs to get solved uh, if we're going to have an impact. Um, and now I've always found it helpful to sort of decompose the energy transition uh, into sort of three parallel transitions, actually. Uh, so there's electrification, which is, I think, what most people think about, right? It's sort of like, you know, electric vehicles uh, is a great example of this, like, hey, we've got to replace our internal combustion engine cars with electric vehicles. Um, so that's that's like one very important component. Uh, a second thing that we have to do is um, we also have to decarbonize the generation of electricity, right? So if we are, have a bunch of electric vehicles, but we're like using coal to generate the electricity, we're just sort of moving emissions around from the tailpipe to the power plant. So while we're doing all this electrification, we also have to decarbonize our generation, right? So that's things like, you know, wind and solar are, are, are great examples there of, of non-CO2 emitting generation. <coughs> Excuse me. And the third part of it, which I think is is less discussed, but but in many ways um, equally as important, is decentralization. Uh, and and to understand what that means, I think it's helpful to sort of under, understand a little bit about how the grid works um, and how it was architected. Um, so th this what you're seeing here is is a, a map of all the sort of high trans high voltage transmission lines uh, in the continental U.S. Um, and basically, this energy system was designed uh, as in a very centralized way, in the sense that you have really big generation assets, so like really big power plants, and then you have one one directional sort of transmission and distribution in infrastructure, like all those wires, and then you have pretty passive uh, edge nodes, right, uh, edge of the grid, which is the buildings, right, who are just using power, right. So it's it's kind of a broadcast network from the generation uh, power plants. To the um, to the buildings, <laughs> excuse me. So that's how this the system was architected, uh, and that's how it's operated for about a hundred years or so. Um, but for a variety, variety of reasons, that that architecture is starting to to shift. And if we think about um, just an average residential home as an example, you know they're becoming generation assets themselves through rooftop solar. Um, they're becoming storage facilities through backup batteries and EVs. And they're becoming increasingly active nodes in the network as more and more load or power is flowing through internet connected devices like smart thermostats or um, smart water heaters. <laughs> Excuse me. So obviously doing all this electrification, getting all this, all this new technology into the home, internet connected, making smart decisions about how to be most energy efficient. Um, Doing this for one home, it's complicated, but you know it's pretty manageable. Doing it for 100 homes is is tricky. Uh, a thousand homes harder, uh, a million homes much harder. And to give you a sense of scale, just in the U.S., there's a border of 100 million homes, right? So it's an absolutely staggering problem to solve at, um, at scale, just because every home is is a little bit unique. Every home is a little bit of a snowflake. So what device makes sense for which home is is isn't the same. Uh, and so it's not easy. Um, and I think one way to, to get some intuition around this problem and also the opportunity in terms of um, ability to impact um, 
climate is to think of a, a giant table of rows and columns. And the rows here um, are buildings. So imagine each row in this table is a building, right? So for every building in the world. So that would be a table with like a billion, uh, over a billion rows, right? Pretty big. Um, and then the columns are interventions. <laughs> Excuse me. So these are things you can do to help improve the building's energy efficiency. So, you know, there's dozens of ways you can do that, right? So there's rooftop solar, back of battery, all the things that I just mentioned. There's, you know, you can do insulation upgrades, uh, et cetera. So that, that you can think of that table. And then the, the elements in that table are the economic impact of doing that intervention, right? So in, for some homes, you know, you put rooftop solar on there and it's great, right? They're producing power. It's actually... Uh, economically beneficial, right? You'll, you can produce, you can make more money. The homeowner can actually make money, more money uh, on the energy they produce than the cost of the system over the course of, you know, the lifetime of the system. Um, but for other folks, it doesn't make sense, right? Like maybe you live in a northern climate or maybe you just like have a lot of trees around your home. And so the unit economics for, for solar might not work. Um, but maybe backup batteries make sense because the price of electricity varies a lot. Or, um, you know, some folks, EVs who drive a lot, EVs are great for other folks less so. So basically every, every home is a little bit different. Um, but if you add up all the value that's available to produce through these, you know, relatively straightforward interventions, there's tens of billions of dollars a year just in the US that you could create every year by you know just you know installing device X in building Y as long as you're doing the right ones, um, and that's why I think this is like a great example of this intersection between climate benefit and economic benefit, right? If you're putting in more energy efficient devices, um, or you're putting in devices that use electricity instead of natural gas, like for water heaters, for example, then you're able to the homeowner can save money. Um, and reduce their carbon footprint, right? So you, you don't have, you know, the green premium or what have you. You can actually, you can actually get both at once. Um, and so this is actually a, a really, really big opportunity, um, both in the U.S. and, and internationally. Uh, and in fact, that's you know, what I started Branch Energy as a company was to specifically help tackle this problem. Um, and uh, we do that in a few different ways. We're helping deliver green energy to our customers. We're helping to figure out which specific device will help save them the most and then making it super easy to get those installed. Um, and then we're also planting one tree per customer per month because trees are great. So we're, we're doing that on the side. Um, and uh, to give you a sense of scale, actually, I've got some updated numbers for Alex. Uh, I think since, since, the, since I sent in the information on my bio, we've made progress. But we're, we're actually closed out the year with uh, over 50 megawatt uh, hours of clean energy delivered and, uh, and 50,000 customers. Uh, trees planted for our customers. So made some good progress there. Um, but I think, you know, it's br branch is just one example, right? I think this is the nature of this challenge is that it's, it's, it's very, very complicated and we need people working on it from every imaginable direction. Um, and so as you're sort of thinking about this from the perspective uh, of governments and, and different, uh, different vectors for accelerating um, building electrification, there's a number that you can consider um, uh, or, or to, to try to help out. I think one is innovation on devices, right? So every year, new and better devices are coming out, whether they're you know, more efficient or lower cost solar panels or uh, high efficiency heat pump water heaters. There's like all these new devices coming out that are more efficient and lower cost and therefore a better fit for more of those cells in that giant table that I was mentioning. Um, there's also a huge opportunity for innovation and progress on the policy front. Um, in fact, the, the U.S. recently passed the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which isn't a great name for a bill that's mostly about climate, but um, it does include a number of uh, provisions to help accelerate electrification, including things like rebates for, uh, for homeowners, right, so they can get um, a discount on high-efficiency devices. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm not totally sure if that's an intentional question or uh, somebody inadvertently mashing the mute button. Um, all right, I'll press on. Uh, yeah, so there's um, efficiency legislation. So there's uh, things that governments can do to um, 
incentivize uh, high efficiency devices or say like after year X where, you know, it's only going to be legal to do certain things, right? So like California has been leading on this charge in terms of um, the phasing out of internal combustion engines uh, as an example. Uh, there's also um, innovation in business, right? I think uh, there's been a, a lot of um, interest in, in funding climate focused startups um, of which branches, you know, one example um, to help find creative ways to, to accelerate the transition. And then sort of a fourth and final level lever uh, is just public awareness, right? I think the more people sort of know about this, the more people care about it, <clears throat> the more likely they are to, to take action and um, make changes in, in their home, which will uh, can have a pretty profound impact on their carbon footprint. So I know that was a lot of context and a, a lot of content to, to blast at you guys uh, uninterrupted. But in terms of a single parting thought, I think I really want to emphasize that to make progress on climate, we really have to do everything everywhere all at once. Um, there, there is no silver bullet. I think the reality is that um, climate touches just about every part of society. And so we can't just be like, well, we'll just figure out energy and it'll be fine. It's like, nope, that's important, but not sufficient, right? And we can't just be like, well, let's just get the policy right and it'll work out. It's like, no, that's important, but not sufficient. Like we, we kind of have to do everything. Um, now, the, the positive silver lining I'll put on that is that no matter what you're interested in, no matter what you're passionate about, there are ways that you can use that energy to, to help on climate, literally, every every sector, every industry, every topic imaginable, um, there's ways to, to help on this front. Uh, so I'm, I'm certainly hopeful that um, that everybody uh, uh, who's watching this uh, can find some way to get excited and and do what they can to help out. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. That was fascinating. Um, so, uh, students, now is your chance to ask questions. Um, I thought that was uh, really interesting. So, um, to get us started, I want to call back to your doctorate. Um, can you talk a little bit about fusion energy? And I know it's held up as the sort of beacon of sustainable sources of masses of energy, but um, how close are we? How realistic is that dream? How close are we? Uh, to achieving it at scale. I know we we made some breakthroughs recently in, in getting more energy out than we put in. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Certainly, I I, I love talking about it. Um, so I guess to start off, just what is it? Um, so fusion is a the process of basically smashing atoms together uh, to produce electricity. So you can think of it in some respects as sort of like the opposite of fission. So uh, if you think about uh, fission reactors or you know, if you ever hear like a nuclear power plant, all the power, nuclear power plants in the world right now that are actually creating electricity are fission plants. And so what that means is you're getting heavy elements like uranium uh, and you're splitting them into smaller elements, which will liberate some energy, which can then be harnessed to create electricity. So that's fission. So you're splitting atoms. Fusion is the opposite process. You're taking light elements, typically hydrogen, um, fusing it, them together. Uh, to form helium, um, and that that can also release energy. Um, so, so that's what it is. Uh, the reason why I think it's 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 really exciting from a climate perspective is that the the fuel uh, hydrogen is literally like you know the most abundant element in the universe, so the inexhaustible supply of fuel. Um, you can create a huge amount of carbon free energy, uh, and unlike fission, it it has um, some really nice safety properties in that you don't have the same kind of like risk of a runaway chain reaction, um, you know, sort of Fukushima, sort of Chernobyl style. So you don't have any of those risks. It's actually quite hard to get the reaction to go. So if anything goes wrong, it just stops. Um, so it, it's got sort of better safety inherently. Uh, and then it also has this nice property that it can't be used to mask a weapons program. Uh, right, so that you don't have the same nuclear proliferation risks. So again, I don't want to go too much into the details, but basically, the equipment you need to um, get the enriched uranium for a power plant is the same equipment you need to enrich that uranium to make a nuclear weapon. 
And so it's a little bit tricky from, uh, from a non-proliferation perspective to uh, keep track of it, right? So, so anyway, so fusion is great for a few reasons, inexhaustible fuel, no CO2, very safe, uh, no, no risk of uh, weapons proliferation. So those are all the great things. Um, the downside is it's like extremely hard to make it work. Uh, so like what you actually have to do to make it work is, is basically smash atoms together super, super fast. Um, like basically the, the nuclei of atoms this is like high school chemistry for those who've, who've made it so, there so far. Um, the nuclei of atoms are positively charged, like charges repel. So it's, it's very hard to get the nuclei of atoms close together. Um, and you can get a Around that by just making them whiz really fast, right? So if they're going fast enough, they can overcome that repulsion and fuse. Um, but it turns out that to get them going fast enough, you have to raise that hydrogen up to like literally hundreds of millions of degrees, like as hot as the sun, uh, which is hard, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, and so um, that that's that's kind of the the challenge with fusion. We've been working on it for for several decades, um, and we can get fusion to happen, right? So we can we can get that that's the hydrogen hot enough to fuse, but we're up until very recently, we've been putting it more energy in to heat up the, the hydrogen to those temperatures than we're getting out of the reaction, right? And which is obviously like not what you want for a power plant. Um, now there have been some really encouraging results recently. Um, uh, and for the first time ever, we, we had a reaction where the amount of fusion energy out was, was larger than the fusion energy in, um, which is really exciting, but it, but it is, uh, like a very early sort of laboratory scale or laboratory test, right? It's it's not ready to be scaled up to be a power plant. Um, and then it's not enough just to make a power plant. You also need to be able to do it reliably and produce electricity at a cost that's economically viable. So we're still like, unfortunately, we're still like quite far away from being able to, you know, power our homes with fusion. Um, but it is it is very promising, and I, I think we will get there eventually. I think it's an open question if we're going to be able to uh, develop the technology to commercial viability um, on a time scale that's short enough to have a really big dent on climate. And I, I certainly hope that that's the case, but it's you know I don't want to underestimate the the challenges. Um, you know, there's a it's an imperfect metaphor, but like if you think about you know, the very first like you know. The Wright brothers and that like for you know Kitty Hawk's first flight, you know, it's sort of like, oh, we did it, we flew, you know, and you know, you got a few seconds of sustained flight. Um, and it, it's sort of the difference between that and sort of like, you know, a hundred flights a day between New York and London for like, you know, a few hundred dollars per person, right? Those those are just two very different scales of uh of, of technical innovation. And and you know, we're we're a little bit closer to Kitty Hawk, frankly, than you know, United. Uh, so anyway, that was an extremely long answer to a short question, but ho hopefully that gives people a, a sense. No, that was fascinating. I hadn't heard some of those angles, so that's great. Um, so along those lines, uh, Caden Lewis Schickman uh, asks, uh, what are the pros and cons of each type of renewable energy? I, I guess you don't have to do all of them, but if you could sort of do the big ones and talk through, you know, solar is these advantages with these disadvantages. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, great. Um, I think think that so that the big the big two are our solar and wind so maybe we can start there and i think the uh the obvious advantage uh is that they don't produce co2 which is which is fantastic um so that that's that's really great the the sort of second advantage is is that they are they are now um almost shockingly the the lowest cost way to produce power in many parts of the world i mean it does vary obviously right um you know, if you're in a very northern or southern climate and you got a lot of uh, cloud cover or whatever, then, you know, solar is going to be less good or what have you. But um, if you take, uh, you know, Texas as an example, um, uh, fantastic uh, solar resources. And and so it it is in terms of the cost to install, you know, a megawatt of uh, solar capacity, that's actually, that's the cheapest way to make power in, in, in Texas and, and many parts of the world. Right, uh, so the the cost of solar has come down just just fantastically over the last few decades. It used to be extremely expensive. Now it's, uh, in many cases, the cheapest source. Um, and wind has come down in cost uh, a great deal as well, though a little bit uh, less fast, uh, not quite as quickly as solar, but still tremendous. So so those are two really big advantages. 
um, you know, non-CO2 emitting um, costs are, are low and, and getting lower. Um, I'd say that the primary disadvantage uh, or uh, two, two disadvantages come to mind. One is that they are inherently intermittent in the sense that the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And so when you start getting a grid that has more and more solar and wind generation on it, right? You can imagine if you all you had was solar, then you, you wouldn't be able to power you know, our, our needs at night, which, you know, not, not not convenient. Um, and so there, there are there are a lot of challenges associated with that that intermittency. Uh, and there, there's certainly ways to deal with there are ways to get around it, but it is it is really important, right? And so like you know you can do things like you know start deploying more batteries so that you can you know charge up those batteries when the sun is shining and then you know discharge them when they're not. But then of course that adds cost and complexity. So um, inter intermittency is, is one big challenge. Um, the other challenge is that oftentimes these solar and wind resources uh, aren't physically where the people are, right? So um, when that's the case, you then have to build uh, long distance transmission lines to bring the power from where it's being generated to where it's being consumed. Um, and that that is costly, but it's also complicated and you know takes up land and, and you know you don't want to be, um, you know, cutting down forests to like make transmission lines and so on like that, though, you know, that does happen, right? So, so that's, a, that's a second. And then the third one too, is if you look at energy density, right? So how many, how much energy do you get out of every sort of acre of land? Um, solar and wind both tend to take up quite a bit more of just physical space than more conventional power plants, right? Whether it's, you know, nuclear or natural gas or what have you. Um, so I think that, that's maybe some of the, the pros and cons, but I, I think we can say, you know, with certainty that solar and wind will both become uh, a, a much larger fraction of the total energy mix um, as we go forward. Uh, and I think we can expect to see, you know, continued price declines. I think we can expect to see a lot more innovation in terms of grid scale, grid scale uh, storage. Um, and then I think I sort of alluded to in my chat, but we're also going to see um, particularly with solar, a lot more distributed solar, right? So a lot of solar, like smaller solar arrays, like literally on buildings, um, uh, paired with with batteries to sort of provide backups for when the grid goes down. So I think um, you know they have their challenges, but they're going to be a huge part of uh, of the solution. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so Ella McDermott uh, says it sounds like there's room for some people or countries to profit from the transition to cleaner energy. Uh, should we assume that policymakers, even in countries that traditionally profit from oil and coal production, realize this and are positioning to take advantage of it? Or do you think those countries see the transition to clean energy as more of a threat? Well, that's a great question and a compound one. Uh, and one, one certainly we don't have the time to fully answer. But I, I think that what the question is getting at is, I think this sort of broader question around a just transition, right? So if we look at, you know, I had that plot of the CO2 concentration um, in the atmosphere and, you know, people have gone through the exercise of trying to estimate, well, what fraction of, of those emissions came from which country? Um, and as you can imagine, the most of the emissions that are in there right now, that are, you know, causing, uh, causing like you know, pain and suffering across the world, even today, right? Let alone um, in the decades to come as the tem as, as temperatures rise, those emissions were associated with economic development of, of what are currently like the more affluent countries. Uh, and so I think there's, there's both technical and ethical questions to resolve around, well, you know, how, how is it fair to ask countries that haven't had the chance to develop as, as much to not use the sort of what might be the cheapest source of power available to them to, you know, give basic, uh, uh, basic services to their citizens that like, no, 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 you guys aren't allowed to do that um, because we're, we're in a jam. Um, so I think that that is sort of a, a, a central question, particularly at the international level, uh, as, as we're trying to sort of come up with frameworks for collective action. And I think, you know, there, there, there were some uh, there was some movement on that in, in the last COP in terms of uh, trying to come up with a framework for, uh, 
for richer countries to sort of subsidize the transition uh, for for countries that are sort of further behind in their development. Um, but that is far from resolved. Uh, and I expect we're going to continue to see that tension play out at the international level all the way down to the local level. Um, and uh, and it's 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 a very a very you know it's 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 a very challenging problem to solve holistically. it's 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 going to come down uh, to decisions made all the way at the sort of like international bodies at the UN all the way down to sort of the municipal zoning and uh, how do we how do we think about uh, moving towards a future that's going to be as sustainable for everybody but but doing it in a way that's just really hard problem. Yeah, and then complicating things. Uh, Jason Wang asks, uh, how would barriers such as trade and sanctions affect the spread of, uh, for example, nuclear energy? So he says, for example, France is blocking Ukraine, who has the largest Ukrainian deposit, uranium uh, deposits in Europe, uh, from entering the EU, as then the French grain would have to compete with Ukrainian grain. Uh, do you have any advice <laughs> for untangling uh, that um, sort of, not just energy, but other sorts of, of barriers as well? Uh, well, I'm not. Uh, sadly, I'm, I I don't have a solution. I think I, I think I have some thoughts on on sort of how those dynamics may play out, um, which is I, I think one thing that we're seeing uh, both through the pandemic and in response to the war in Ukraine is a sort of more full understanding of the brittleness of how, how interconnected the world is right now. Right, we have like pretty extended supply chains. There's, uh, you know, people can be sourcing things from a particular part of the world, and like, what happens if they can't anymore? Uh, and so, I think what that is has meant geopolitically um, is that many countries are sort of reevaluating their posture, um, you know, both from a national security perspective, but also from a like primary resource and power perspective, to try to to be more self sufficient. Right. So I'll, I'll use the sort of U.S. lens just because it's, it's the country with which I'm most familiar. But um, the these 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 dynamics are playing out in sort of more interest in, for example, doing more um, like solar and wind and, and, and more resources that are domestic so that you are less re reliant on uh, international trade. Right. So that that's. That's the sort of thing where you might trade off some efficiency for resilience, um, which is a which is a common trade off in a system, right? You can you can be more efficient, but then your the system can be more brittle. And I think what, what we're seeing, you know, since since the outbreak of the war, is a little bit of a pullback to be like, okay, well, let's let's try to build uh, more, let's like you know shift a little bit more towards resilient um, than efficient, uh, and that that'll you know that's playing out in in all sorts of primary resources, uh, in, you know including uh, uranium. Awesome, thank you. Um, so speaking of some trade-offs, uh, Neil Panchal asks, can you discuss your approach to adapting to and mitigating the potential effects of climate change on operation and infrastructure? Like how does branch energy, for example, assess and manage risks related to climate change like sea level rise or extreme weather? Yeah, it's again another another profound question, um, and I think I think the answer there depends both on geography and and time scale. Um, I think what we are what we are likely to see over time is that the amount of time and energy that's being spent on uh, adaptation will necessarily rise, right? Uh, and so, like the like an obvious example of this is as we get sort of more frequent and more powerful storms, we're going to have to spend uh, more time and resources on trying to protect infrastructure that we have, um, uh, and and I think we're also going to we you know hasn't hasn't happened so much yet, but I think uh, over the next decade we're going to start to see examples um, not just internationally but but you know certainly in the U.S. where uh, you know in some cases entire communities may have to just sort of like upstakes. Right, and be like, oh, like it, it turns out we we can't consistently continue to to live in this place the way we have it before, right? Like, if if for example you just get massive damaging floods every few years, then eventually you just like 
can't get those homes insured and then the property value falls and like you'll and then you know the governments which are often um, funded through property values you, you end up in this like negative feedback loop and, and communities won't just will have to move although they'll die slowly um and so i don't mean to be dour but i, I that that sort of stuff is is likely to come um so anyway i, I think I, i'm not trying to dodge the question but it's sort of like the the mix of adaptation and mitigation is is going to vary hugely depending on location and context but I, I think certainly on the time scale of decades that the broad trend is going to be a shift to having to do more adaptation yeah speaking of um locations and, and differences uh so the g20 as you probably know is a gathering of the 20 most powerful economies in the world including the european union which is a, a bunch of uh individual nations of course um but of course, the G20 makes decisions that impacts everyone. So I'm just sort of going to paraphrase a couple of questions here. Uh, one from Carlos here, Herrera Rodriguez, and the other from Chang Yu, um, talking about uh, developing countries and um, what types of energy solutions are more effective in less developed countries and sort of what is the responsibility of developed countries who are able to invest in these green energies what is their responsibility what is their incentive for uh sharing their technologies with the world yeah great question again a, a compound one so I'll, I'll i'll try to give a fulsome answer um I, I think in terms of maybe taking the second part first in terms of incentives i think you know all all the nations of the world uh, sort of share the desire to to mitigate climate change. So I think there's there's at least at that level there's there's incentive um, certainly. Uh, and then in terms of how that can be done or like you know what, what's the incentive to to share technology, I think a lot of that the the core mechanic there is is sort of market forces in the sense that um, you know you'll be motivated to share your technology if you know, companies can profitably deploy those technologies in a way that, and if that, you know, also helps reduce emissions, then, you know, all the better. Uh, so I think, I think those are like maybe some of the incentives. I think the, the harder question is like the responsibility question, um, which sort of I alluded to before, right? I think you can, you can take the sort of purist economic sort of hyper rational view of it, uh, to try to sort of peek, peek through it. But I think there's also sort of the, this more sort of moral dimension to it, right? Which is, should the nations who have benefited the most uh, from the pollution and, and the emissions that, have, that are causing these challenges, uh, shouldn't they have to uh, help the, the, the countries that, that haven't had those benefits? Uh, and I think the answer is yes, um, in, in broad terms. But I think the, the hard thing is to figure out how to make that real and effective, right? Um, particularly given that a lot of these, you know, democracies are are can be challenging, challenging ways to sort of push through these these sorts of uh, these sorts of things. Um, so it's it's very hard, you know. And I'm I'm not. Uh, I, I try I try to be optim. You know, I'm an optimistic person by nature. I think that that's gonna, that's the 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 part of this that I I. I'm I'm the least clear on on how we're going to get something that that's sort of workable. I think the the places where I'm like feeling quite optimistic, there's a huge amount of technological development. Things are getting like better, faster, cheaper, all that good stuff. We've got way more people working on this problem than even a few years ago. Um, so I think we're going to make a lot of progress on that front. I think it, it remains to be seen, you know, how the countries of the world can come together to do this in a way that that's just. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully, 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 some of I was hoping that some of you on this call might be able to share some thoughts with me, frankly. But um, yeah, I, you know, let's 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 do it together. Let's work on it together. Well, they're they're just getting started, and uh, one of my questions here was going to be, what makes you feel optimistic? Uh, and I guess I'll I'll jump in with a quick answer, which is the quality of the questions that we're getting from our students here. You know, if they're thinking this deeply about it now, um, I'm hoping they'll feel empowered to go out and and make a difference. Um, so let's see here. I, I did have one that I wanted to ask. Um, another one from from Neil um, that sort of combined with one of mine. Can you provide specific examples of uh, 
initiatives, projects, um, legislation uh, currently being implemented or planned around the world? Can you highlight a couple of the the things that you the countries or the the organizations or whatever that you think are doing a really good job here? Um, well, I guess uh, in terms of legislation, I sort of alluded to it earlier, but the um, the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act has a lot of great stuff in it. Um, and I think, again, sort of using an example of an example, right, this, this is a very broad ranging piece of legislation that covers a huge number of things. But, you know, the part of it that's sort of perhaps most relevant to the, the, the space that Branch Energy is playing in is the, the government's putting in place these rebates to help incent people to do these home energy upgrades. Uh, and they're, they're quite generous, right? So like, as, as an example, many folks in the US have uh, natural gas water heaters, right? So the way you get your hot shower in the morning is there's like a big tank, you know, in your basement or in your attic, and you're like, there's a little flame under it. And it's like basically a giant kettle with like, you know, a little, little flame under it, right? Um, and uh, and that's how it's being done. And obviously that, you know, has emissions associated with both the burning of the fuel and the transportation of the methane, and all that stuff. Um, but there's now some like really fantastic high efficiency heat pump water heaters, which I know sounds insanely boring, but I promise you it's not, it's awesome. Uh, and you can basically swap out that natural gas water heater with these like fantastically efficient electric water heaters, yeah. right? And so if you do that, uh, and you're drawing power from a largely decarbonized grid, then instead of burning fossil fuels to heat your shower, you're using the sun, right? Or the wind, which is great. Um, but now the downside though, is those super efficient, highly optimized devices, they tend to just cost more upfront, right? So like, even if it saves you money over time, right? It's like less costly to operate, like the cost per shower is lower or whatever. Um, so even if it's gonna save you money over the course of the 10 years that you own that device, because the upfront cost for the natural gas one is lower, a lot of people just buy that, right? So they're like, oh, this one's cheaper, I'll just buy the cheap one. Um, and so what these what these rebate programs do is they help to lower the price, dif the upfront price difference between the natural gas water heater and the electric water heater, right? So that way you can be like, okay, well, I'll get the electric one, it's about the same price and it costs me less to operate, I'll do that. Um, so, you know, again, this is like a very, very narrow example, but I think this gets back to my point about like everything everywhere all at once. Like we need, we literally need to replace like millions of natural gas water heaters, right? Like we have to, we collectively as a society, we gotta go, gotta go do all that, right? And that's like, and there's like 50,000 things like that, which are like all hard and time consuming and fiddly. Um, and we gotta do all of them. Um, but, you know, that that's like one narrow example where like, getting that rebate in place to sort of align the incentives of the end consumer uh, can dramatically accelerate how, how quickly we do something like this. So I, I think, and by the way, I mean, it wasn't the direct question, but I think um, one thing that you'll find when you sort of dig in on climate, like it gets wonky and weird and specific, like pretty quickly, like if you actually wanna go make a difference and actually like see it through, you end up getting into the, all of these nitty gritty stuff. Um, and so I, I certainly encourage folks to like pick something that they're inherently interested in and fascinated by because you're gonna have to like roll up your sleeves and get a little bit uh, dirty if you wanna make a difference. So, so any um, answer that you can do right now is a good answer. <laughs> fair. fair. Um, so I had a question on that. Um, Sorry, my dog was barking and I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, so I get, could you, you know, I'm going back to the the big pie chart that you shared and how much of a chunk is industry or energy production. And I, I just wonder, can you talk a little bit about the responsibility of the individual versus the responsibility of sectors and like, what can an individual do? Yeah, this is a great question. And I'd, I'd say it's, um, I think there's a lot of de debate that, you know, if you're sort of like reading sort of climate literature and stuff, and, and a lot of this stuff gets framed as sort of like, you know, you know, versus, right? Um, and I, I think that's, that's not necessarily the right framing. 
right? I think it, bo both both of the following statements are true. You know, if even if everyone, if every individual does everything right, that's still not enough. Too much. There's too much of these decision, important decisions, are living with governments and corporations, and the individual uh, can only do so much. So that's a true statement. It's also a true statement that um, that if individuals do nothing, we, we this doesn't work, right? So bo both things can be true. We actually need we need both. That's like everything yeah, everywhere all at once, right? Um, so I think I think there's. I think the what's helpful as an individual is you can you can make some changes in your own life that will have some impact. It's not necessarily going to like change the whole world. There's like all these systemic issues that that you don't have direct control over. But um, what I what I think you'll find, right, if you sort of think of it from a more of a systems view, is that like if you start making changes in your life, right, modest as they may be in the grand scheme, then that might influence people you know. Right, it might influence how they live their lives. It might influence who you vote for. It might influence what the people who who you vote for uh, focus on from a legislative perspective. Right, and so I think the the way we we make progress on this on the time scale of of decades, right, is is to to push on both things really hard uh, as as quickly as we can, and then you get these sort of positive feedback loops, right, where like if more and more people care about, you know, sort of choosing the more energy efficient thing or like switching to electric, then you have, you get sort of more demand for it, which brings costs down for people. You get more sort of more of a political uh, constituency for it. Like, you, you, like it all sort of feeds on itself in a positive way. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a yes and <laughs> it, for, for this one. Um, uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, uh, we're coming up on time, so I guess we'll have to leave it on that idea of the domino effect, that all of the dominoes are, are knocking into each other, and hopefully we can uh, we can really make an impact here. Um, so uh, Alex, Dr. Enns Cushman, uh, thank you so much for your time uh, and your expertise. Uh, I found it fascinating, and I'm sure the students did as well. Um, and I know there were a lot of questions we didn't get to. Thank you all for your enthusiasm. Uh, bring it into the summit. So, um, so with that, uh, we'll draw tonight to a close. Uh, and actually, I'm gonna yeah boot you off and share my screen here. Uh, okay. So yeah, um, I hope this gave you all some food for thought to digest throughout the summit. Uh, MG20 alumni, we're so happy you were able to join us. Uh, and current Model G20 delegates and deciding committee members. We're very excited for our first full day together tomorrow, and we hope you are as well. Uh, you'll get to meet with your country delegations for the first time, get to know each other, and select the roles you'll take on throughout the summit. There may also be one or two exciting announcements, so please stay tuned. Uh, please be on the Zoom link tomorrow by 6.45 p.m. Eastern. We will get started promptly at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening, Eastern time. Um, Again, uh, please say thank you to Dr. Ince Cushman for his insights. Um, I hope they were helpful and I'm excited to see the sorts of solutions you all come up with. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Alex. I don't know who said that, but you're welcome.